Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I'm Nico Matsakis. I work on Rust. I'm on the core team, the compiler team, and the lang team, so I'm like a little bit involved. And uh, I want to talk to you about Polonius, and I want to address up front the most burning question, the most common question, what, where is that name even coming from? Some of you who may recall your high school education or some other education, uh, you may remember Polonius as that dude who gets stabbed in Hamlet. He's behind a curtain. I don't remember why. Um, don't tell my high school English teacher. <laughs> but he also is famous for this quote that he says to his son, neither borrower nor lender be, for loan oft loses both itself and friend. And I'm sorry to tell you, well, it's not a well-known fact, but Polonius was a C hacker. Yeah. He was, uh, <laughs> and he was passing on like professional advice to his son, just saying, like, be really careful when you mess with references, because you could, uh-oh, what's no. wrong? Where? All right, you're interrupting the flow of my joke. Um, so <laughs> the good news is he didn't actually die in Hamlet. He recuperated in the hospital in the time he read the excellent program, the Rust programming language by Carol Nichols and Steve Kladnick, and he got really into it. And he has since adopted Rust, and he's given a new quote, you know, borrow, lend, whatever, compilers got your back, go out and build your dreams. Uh, and we're here today to, to talk about that, right? Um, so, so, yeah, so that's what, so Polonius is named in honor of Polonius, and what it is is it's a kind of reimagination of the Rust borrow checker. And as an end user, you won't notice if we ever do adopt it for real. Uh, this is all still work in progress. You won't notice much difference, except that more programs work than used to, but from the inside, from the way that Polonius is structured, it's very different, and that's what I'm here to talk about. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through kind of the classic borrow checker error, decompose it, explain how the current borrow checker thinks and analyzes and finds errors like that, and then show how Polonius does it, and then show you why the Polonius approach allows us to accept more programs and has potential for the future to over, open even more doors. Um, so this, in my mind, is the classic borrow checker error. Um, what you have here is you have a local variable named x. It's not quite as readable as I would like, but hopefully you can read it. You have a local variable named x, and then you, it gets borrowed here. So y equals ampersand x. And that borrow creates a reference to x, which is a shared reference, which means x is immutable while that reference is in use. And on the next line, we try to mutate it. And indeed, on the line after that, we go and use the reference. So we get an error saying you can't mutate this content because it's currently shared. And the, the compiler actually does a pretty decent job of saying, like, you know, here's the borrow, here's the mutation, and here's the, the use that comes later. And, so, and you can sort of see that they're sandwiched in between. All right, now, if we try to take that error and make it like a little more formal, we might phrase it sort of like this. You get an error at some program statement n if that statement n accesses a path p. OK, so statement n, that's the x plus equals 1. That's where the error is detected. But what is this thing path? Right? What is a path? So what I mean by path, a path is basically some expression that leads to a memory location. Right? So a local variable, x, that's a path. Because on your stack, there's a slot that stores the value of x, and that's the memory location. Paths can be composed. So x dot f is some field of that local variable. Right? So it takes the whole variable and narrows down to just the field in question. Star x dot f then follows a pointer off into memory. So now the memory we're referencing is off in the heap, but it's still memory somewhere in the computer. right? And then you can also have indexing. Those are paths. Other kinds of expressions, like the number 22, calling a function, those are not paths. Those, are, those produce values, but those values then have to get stored somewhere. Right? So a path is kind of something you could assign to. Um, so OK. So we've got now, now we know what a path is. So we can say, all right, we get an error if there's a statement n like x plus equals 1, modifying a path p, like x, and accessing the path p would violate the terms of some loan L. OK, well, hold up. Um, what's a loan? Well, a loan is the name I'm using, for maybe obvious reasons, for the result of borrowing something. Right, so when you borrow x, the compiler in its mind has a loan. Um, and that loan is saying it's tracking the fact that x was borrowed, so it tracks what was borrowed, which is some path, and a mode, either shared or mutable. Right? And when you have a loan, uh, 
you can violate the terms of the loan by doing things to the path that are not allowed. So if you have a shared loan of some path P, then mutating the path P would violate the terms of the loan, right? Because the idea is when I share something, everybody can share it, but nobody is supposed to change it, right? And so mutating would change it. Similarly, if you have a mutable loan, just any access to the path P is a violation because the idea of a mutable loan is saying, I have created a reference and now that reference is the only way to access this memory. So if you go and use the original path that led to the memory, you would violate the terms, okay? Uh, and, and you'll notice I wrote directly or indirectly. All that means, that means a few things, but one of the things that means is, like in our example, we have a kind of direct violation. We lent out the path X, and then we mutated the path X, exactly the same. Indirectly, well, you might also have a structure, not just, a, a, like a, just an individual value, but a structure, uh, like here, some struct, and then we might lend out that whole structure, um, and then mutate some field of the structure. Now we're not mutating exactly what we lent out. We lent out x, and we're mutating x.field, but it's good enough. It's still a violation. Okay, so let's go back to our error. So we have here the statement n accesses a path p. Accessing the path p violates the term of a loan. So we can apply that to our thing and saying x plus equals 1, the loan here is the ampersand x, and, we're, and mutating x violates the terms of that loan L. And we have one last condition now. That loan L has to be live. Okay, okay. What do I mean by live? So that's compiler jargon, but it's pretty simple. Something is live if it might get used later on. So really, you don't just say it's live. You actually say it's live at a certain point in the program. And at that point, if there might be some later use, uh, then the thing is live. And usually it's used for variables, uh, like, like local variables, right? So if you think of this program, um, at this point, we might say, is the variable x live? And actually the answer might surprise you. The answer is no, even though clearly there are uses of x later on. And the reason for that is that although there are uses of x, we're not using the value that's currently stored in x, right? We store one here, and then we immediately overwrite that with two. Nobody ever reads the value one. So in compiler terms, you would say that variable is not live. Its value, its current value will never be used. Um, however, if we go to the next line, now the, val the x has the value two, and this is live because if we don't go through the if, then we might read two here at this print. So it's x is live here. Um, interestingly, if we jump inside the if, like just before we assign four, then we can say it's dead again. It's not live here because we're about to, we're about to overwrite it. And it's also dead, or not live, I guess, either one, at the very end because there's presumably no more uses of x that will come. So that, uh, that's what a live variable is. So what do I mean by a live loan? Well, if you think of a loan creates some reference, right? Ampersand x creates and returns a reference that's gonna get stored and passed around. Then the loan is still live if that reference or some other reference that was derived from it might get used later, okay? So by reference derived from it, well, this is what I mean by that. Um, here I have a little snippet, which I hope you can read. Oh, okay, which I start out with one loan right here um, where I'm saying y equals ampersand foo. I'm loaning out the variable foo. And then uh, I create a new loan of y here. Or sorry, I create a new loan z, which goes to y.bar, right? And the point is, we're not gonna use the reference y anymore. So you might think, oh, well, I guess it's dead. And yes, the variable y is dead because we're not using y directly. But the loan is not dead because now this, this variable z is kind of based on it, right? It came from it. And so when we use it here, we still consider the loan to be live. Okay, good. So now we actually have our complete template for what a, the classic borrow checker error is. There is an access to a path at a statement n. That's right here. We're accessing the path x. Then that path was borrowed in some loan. And the access, the kind of access is not compatible, so it's mutating, it's a shared loan. And the loan is live, which it is because it might get used later on. So if you look at this error, you can see 
two things. Um, well, one thing, actually. <laughs> what you can see is that this first two statements, these are kind of very directly figure outable from the uh, source line in question. Right? You don't have to like, do anything complex. So if I see x plus equals 1, I can immediately see that that's writing to the path x. So that's, that's a statement n writing the path x. And if I look at ampersand x, I can immediately see that it's borrowing the path x. It's a local property. But figuring out if a loan is live, that's a lot more complicated. That actually requires us to reason across the program um, and figure out, like, will there maybe be a future use? And that's not surprisingly where all the complexity of the borrow checker like, comes from. Um, so how do we do it today? Well, what we do today is we compute this thing called a lifetime. And you've probably heard the phrase lifetime if you've worked a little bit in Rust. It came up in some of our earlier talks. Uh, well, what, so what is a lifetime? So in some sense, you might say, oh, it's this tick A syntax or tick whatever that you've seen in Rust. But what the compiler thinks of a lifetime as internally is actually sort of different than that. It is the part of the program where that reference might be used. So if I have like an ampersand U32, part of that type, that ampersand, is associated with it, the part of the program where it might be used. And what do I mean by part of the program? I can make it really concrete for you. So this is our program. We can add some line numbers to it. The part of the program where it might be used is just like a set of line numbers. That's actually how the compiler thinks about it. It doesn't use line numbers. It makes a control flow graph and uses a set of nodes. But it's the same basic concept. So we could say, for example, the variable y might be used on lines 2 and 3. OK? Um, and this is how what the, way we, the way we actually compute this is we're going to do something. That's the result we're going to get. But the way we compute that result is through a process called lifetime inference. And what, how it works is we make little variables. We basically give, for every reference and every lifetime it appears in any type anywhere, we make a fresh variable. And this is a variable in the sense of your algebra class, where you have like a constraint of a set of equations, like x greater than or equal to 1 and y greater than or equal to x, and you solve for a value of those x's and y's. A variable in that sense, right? Algebraic sense. And the compiler's job is to figure out what set of lines does tick 0 and tick 1 represent. And I gave them these numbers instead of names to show you that it's not like real syntax that you can actually type. This is the compiler's internal reasoning. Um, and the way that it does that is through two things. Uh, it, it kind of figures out relationships between these variables. But let me just explain what these, these two references are for a second. So the first one, the ampersand x expression, that is going to create a reference, right? So that sort of creates a value of type ampersand u32 that's going to get then stored later into y. And that value has a type, which is ampersand u32. But it's actually ampersand tick 1 u32, right? We're, we're computing, because for every reference, we have to have a lifetime. So that type needs to have a lifetime. And we're calling that lifetime tick 1. And then this tick 0, that's the type, the stack slot has a type. And that's the, uh, the reference that appears in there. And so clearly, there's a relationship between these two lifetimes. So I'm going to take the reference that I make, and I'm going to store it into the stack slot. So the stack slot's type has to be you know, related to the type of the values that get put into it. If you think of like Java or something, you store a string into a thing of type object. These are two different types, but there's a relationship between them, if that made any sense. So it's a subtyping relationship. Anyway, leave that aside. Let's look at the actual values. So what is tick 0? So we want to compute what are the lines where this reference y might get used later. And we basically do this based on a liveness rule. So we look at the variable y, and we say, where is the variable y live? In the same sense that I talked to you about it earlier. Where might it get used later? For every line where y is live, all the lifetimes in y have to include that line. Right? So in this case, y is live on lines 2 and 3. It gets assigned on line 1. So whatever come before that doesn't matter, because it's, that's an old value that's overwritten. And then we assume this is the end of the program, so there's no further uses. So it's live on lines 2 and 3. And so tick 0 is going to be like a set of 2 and 3, two different lines. Meanwhile, if we look at tick 1, so this is that reference that got created by ampersand x, and it's getting stored into y. And if, if you think about it, that reference is never directly used, so to speak. I mean, it's sort of used as part of the assignment, but you can't 
It's, it's like a value that uh, can't be named until it's stored into a variable. So it's never live in that sense, but we, can still, uh, we still are constrained because it has to outlive tick zero. In order for us to be able to store a reference into a slot, um, that reference has to live longer than that slot, right? Or otherwise you'd have a, like an alias, you'd have another copy of the reference with a shorter lifetime, that would be weird. Um, you'd be saying the base reference is gonna get used. Um, sorry, that would mean you could copy from here and use from there, use it for longer, that would be bad. So we get this relationship and we find out, okay, everywhere Y is used, clearly this value is also gonna get used because it's getting stored into Y. So we compute that tick one is the set two and three. Okay, so when we're done, we get this result. We created a reference. It's gonna live for two lines, two and three, and it's gonna get stored into Y, and here's a lifetime. And now we can jump back to our definition and we say, okay, we have a lifetime of the reference, which is the part of the program where it might be used. And uh, we know that each loan, we, now we wanna figure out, sorry, what is the lifetime of the loan? We said the original question we were trying to answer was not what is the lifetime of references, but what is the lifetime of the loan? Is it live at a particular point? And the answer is we just look at the lifetime on the reference. So um, look at the lifetime on the reference that is created by the loan. That's the set of lines where the loan might be used. Done. So now we can say, okay, here's our program. The statement N accesses a path P. Acts, uh, that's line two. So the path P is X and it's a mutation. Accessing the path P would violate the terms of the loan L, which is up here on line one. Uh, it's because it's the same path and it's, not, it's using a disallowed sort of access. And finally, we know that this loan is live because we just look at its lifetime right there and we see that it includes the line two. So we can report an error, done. But that's how the borrow checker works, kind of. I'm gonna expand it in one second. Um, now, what happens in Polonius? So in Polonius, it works differently. We don't have lifetimes. <laughs> uh, I don't mean that the Rust surface syntax changes. There's still tick A's and stuff. But the thing that they represent inside the compiler is different. We instead call it an origin. And the idea is instead of tracking where might this reference get used, like looking to the future, we track where did this reference come from? What loans might have created this reference? Um, so we look to the past. And it's gonna be a set, in other words, of loans. So that makes our inference, we still have to do an inference step, but it works kind of differently. It works in the opposite direction, so to speak. So if I create my two variables, tick zero and tick one, instead of inferring them to a set of lines, I'm gonna infer them to a set of loans now. So let's start, last time we started with tick zero, but because we're going in the other direction, we're gonna start with tick one this time. So what is the origin of the reference created by ampersand X? What loans might it have come from? Well, that's really easy. It's just that loan, right? It's just the loan for this expression ampersand X, L1. It's a singleton set because we just created the reference. That's where it came from. Um, and so tick zero, well, there's only one assignment to the variable Y. So it must have come from there. So we also can say this is clearly just the set L1. If there were many assignments to Y, like maybe Y is a mutable variable and it gets assigned from many places, then it would be the union of all those places, but this is a simple case. So this is our end result. We have two, life, uh, two, two origins, and both of them are the singleton set L1. So we're saying all the references here clearly came from this ampersand X expression right there. We can trace them. Now, notice something. Liveness, I didn't talk about liveness at all. But when I did the inference before, I had to think about where was the variable y live, and that impacted the end result. I don't talk about that anymore. I only talk about this subtyping, this data flow relationship. When you create a reference, where does it get stored to? Right? That's all that matters for computing the origin. So now we come back, and now we have this question. Okay, now we know the origin of every reference, but the thing we wanna know is, is the loan live? How do we answer that? And this is where liveness comes in. So we're at some program point, we look at all the live variables at that program point and say, what is the origins of their types? In other words, what loans are in their type? So if we come back here, um, let's, this is our example. We have the statement N, which is line two. It's accessing the path X, that's in violation of the term L1. And now we wanna say, 
is this loan, L1, is it live or not? And so to answer that, we look at this point, line two, and we say, what, what variables are live here? Well, the variable y is live. It's going to get used later. And the type of the variable y includes the loan L1. Therefore, L1 is live, so we get an error. So the liveness doesn't come in when we compute the types, but it comes in when we're checking to see if there's an error later on. OK, I'm going to stop here because this is like pretty crucial. I know I'm not supposed to take questions, but this is a different sort. Does anybody have any questions on this? Yes. Yes, can I walk through it again? I will walk through it again. So we compute that there's an error because first, we know that on line two, we're accessing the path x, and that violates the terms of L1. So if L1 is live, that's a problem because we're mutating x, and that's a, bar uh, a borrow of x, right? That makes sense? So now the question is, is the loan live? And to answer that, we look forward from this point, from line two, and we say, what variables might get used in the future? In this case, the answer is the variable y is one of those variables. And then we look at their types. Did any of those, is that a reference that might have come from the loan L1? And if it is, then we have a problem because that means the L1 might get used, right? And we can tell where it might have come from because that's what we, that's the whole thing we're trying to compute. So we basically ask, is the loan L1 in the type of any of these things? And here's the type of Y. It does indeed reference L1, and so we get an error. So I guess that would be the, the nutshell is exactly this, that we compute where everything came from, and then we look at what we might use and see if any of them came from this loan. And if so, that would be a problem. Yes? Yes, so he asked if I can uh, compare it to what was happening before Polonius. And the answer is before, we, we sort of did the same thing in a way, but we did it in a different way. <laughs> Before, what we did was, when we were figuring out the references, we were figuring out their lifetimes, we looked forward. We, we weren't thinking about it in relation to a particular error, right? That's the key difference, we'll see later. We were just computing, in general, where might this reference get used? What is the set of lines where this reference might get used in the future? And then later, when we have a potential error location, we compare it against that set. Whereas now, we're computing, in general, where did everything come from, and then, when we have a particular error location, we figure out, and what might get used here, and we check if any of them came from that spot. Yes? So the, the, space, so the question is, does it narrow the space that gets searched when it's doing this? I, I'm gonna, I don't know how to answer that question because I don't fully understand it, but I think that <laughs> it's going to get answered very shortly which is, I think the question is, why does this matter? Like, why are you telling me this? And I'm gonna show you an example where it makes a big difference. Um, all right, yes. Okay, so if line three was print x, would that be an error? The answer is no, because the type of x is u32. It doesn't have any loans in it. Um, it's just a value, so this loan would, the variable y would be considered dead, and no live variable has, a, has L1 in it. Okay, any more questions? All right. um, okay, one, one more and then I'm moving on. Okay, if the question was, if I replaced Y here with ampersand X, would I get an error? And again, the answer is no, because the variable Y is still not live. The only live variable looking forward is X and its type doesn't have a loan. And to go a little further, there's a, what you would then do is you'd be making a second loan. But there's two borrow statements, and that's a second loan. And yes, L2 might be considered live, but L2, uh, L2 hasn't even started yet, actually. So nothing that's live came from L2, so to speak. OK. Um, uh, OK. So we get an error. Um, and now, as I promised, why did you take me through all of this subtle two versions of the same thing that sound kind of identical? Uh, the difference, it comes up in this example, which was one of the examples 
I don't know how well known this fact is, but I'm gonna claim it's little known. A little known fact is that when we did NLL, which is the non-lexical lifetimes that we introduced in Rush 2018, we originally thought we would handle three classic cases, and we only got two. And the reason was, that is to say, there were three things that are errors, and we wanted them to not be, and we only eliminated two of them. And the reason was that it turned out to be just really hard to do this third case, which is this one. Um, it was computationally infeasible, and the, the analysis was also a lot more complicated. So we simplified it in order to get, you know, make some progress and come back to it later. And what is so complicated about this example? Um, it's sort of, in some sense, nothing. So what happens here is you have a function that takes a mutable reference to a map. It's gonna return something out of that map. It's gonna return a string that's in the map somewhere. And it begins by asking, does the map have the key 22 in it? And if so, it returns the value. And if not, it inserts a new value and then returns a reference to that new value that we just inserted. And this is a pretty common pattern. Of course, savvy Rust users will know they could use the entry API, and that would be cool. But part of the reason the entry API even exists was to work around the fact that you can't write this function, and it was super annoying. And we were like, oh, we could do entry. Um, turned out entry was also cool on its own merits. But, uh, so it would be nice if you could write this. Sometimes you'd like to write this. And the particular thing that makes this special is that it's a function, and we're returning this outside of the function. If you did this all within one function, it will work just fine. It's the fact that it's going outside of the function. And why does that matter? Um, well, first of all, here's the error you get. So you can see that some reason the compiler thinks you made a borrow here, you loaned out uh, the, the variable map, and it thinks that that loan is still live when you're calling insert, but it's wrong, right? Because if we think back to our definition of is a loan live, it was is there some reference that came from that loan that's still in, gonna be in use? And the answer is no. But to make that a little clearer, I wanna explain it in terms of a lightly desugared version of that function. So this is like slightly more explicit Rust syntax. I did two things. First, I gave a name to this elided lifetime tick A. So that's the lifetime of the map that's coming in. And then I rewrote map.get to be the, the function call version. So in Rust, a method call like map.get can be rewritten as uh, type colon colon get, and the first argument is actually ampersand star map. The star is kind of not that important here. The point is we're borrowing the map in order to call hash map get. And so it's exactly this borrow that the compiler thinks is still live here. But if you look, we're gonna make a reference here, a shared reference, and the only value of that shared reference uh, that's like still derived from that shared reference is v. And v is obviously not live here because v is not in scope here. However, the problem is, what is the lifetime of v actually? I told you that a lifetime is a set of lines, but Actually, in this case, those lines are relative. When I said lines, I really meant lines in the current function. And the lifetime of v cannot be contained within one function. It's going to be returned from this function and given to a caller, right? So actually, the lifetime of v is this thing tick a, because it's saying it lives as long as uh, the caller wants it to, right? And so if you think about it, you can imagine here's the function getter insert right here. And here is the caller. So the lifetime tick A, what does that represent really? That might be like lines two and three in the caller, but it's something we can't know in short. And there could be many callers, of course. So from the way that lifetimes really work today, they're actually one of two things. They could be a set of lines. So any reference that's completely contained within the current function, we can do the set of lines that we did before. But a reference that crosses and gets returned out has to be kind of blown up to one of these named lifetimes, like tick A. And the important part is that named lifetime is some part of our caller, and it includes the entire call to us and then some more stuff. So it basically includes all the lines in the function. And so for that reason, the compiler thinks, OK, I have a loan here. It has to be tick A. It can't just be some set of lines. And tick A includes my entire function, so when I get down here, well, that's part of my current function. It must be illegal. Um, so that's exactly what I was, I think it was you two, but I'm not sure. When we were saying, what is the key difference? It's exactly this. If you just think about how long does this live, the answer is it lives 
until some part of our caller returns, which is for the rest of this function at least, right? But that's not exactly the right question. You want a slightly different question. Um, and that's where Polonius comes in. So with Polonius, we make a loan here. Let's call it L1. That loan is part of a type of V. And we see that V is returned. And we have to, there's some, some logic we have to do there. But when we get here at this point, um, there, there, are, there are no live variables that have that loan in their type. Right? There are no variables at all that have that loan in their type. Uh, and so there's no error. And map.insert is legal. And everything's fine. Basically, the way, uh, the way Polonius winds up working is we have to check that check, uh, we, don't, we aren't concerned with how long the reference will be live. We're only concerned with where did things come from at this moment. And when we return, we obviously have to check that this value of v came from something that has tick a, and we can do that. But it's not really relevant when v is not live. So that's why Polonius is better. Um, and actually, this example, we had a way. The original NLL had a more complex formulation that could handle this example. But it was, as I said, computationally infeasible and kind of hard to think about. It turned out there were some more complex examples that came up later on that just could not be expressed in this way. You have to have the Polonius viewpoint to handle them. Um, because I forget why, to be honest. They're complicated. <laughs> but there wasn't a way to, to do it. It was exactly this turn that made it possible. So that's cool. Um, but actually, I think that this way of thinking of things as origins has other future uses that might be really great. And at this point, I should warn you that we're entering like wild speculation territory. Um, do not consider this to be language features that are in active progress. But <clears throat> one of the big limitations of Rust that comes up when you do more advanced patterns um, is that when you have a borrowed reference, it has to be tied to something on the stack, essentially. right? So. What you would like to sometimes be able to do is to say, I have a struct called message that owns a buffer, which is a vector of strings. And then I have a reference that is pointing into something owned by that buffer. And you can't do this today. right? You can't have tick buffer here. It would have to be a parameter and be talking about something outside of this struct. We kind of want a struct that can reference parts of itself. And that would have been really useful for like async await and so on. Well, that's kind of what we have with async await, but we just cheated essentially by building it into the language instead of building this, this fundamental mechanism in. Um, so how could we do that? I don't know exactly how this will work. There's a lot of complexity to consider. But one thing I do know is if we had this feature, when I'm going to create a message struct, I'm going to have to give it two things a value for each of these fields. One of them is clearly going to have to be a buffer, and the other is going to have to be some reference that points into that buffer. Right? So I need to be able to check the compiler in order to make sure that everything's you know, on the level is going to be able to have to check that that reference points kind of came from that buffer. Right? And if you, to ask, if you want to answer that question, lifetimes are the wrong tool. Um, if we just know, if we have only lifetimes, all we know is where the reference might get used. That's not what we care about. We don't care about that. Right? We, came from, we care about where did it come from instead. And that's exactly what the origins are tracking. So it feels to me like this, uh, this kind of opens a door to language features that were closed off with the old analysis. Um, so I'm pretty excited about it. I want to tell you a little bit more about Polonius itself. And the current status is we have a working group as part of the compiler team that's exploring Polonius. Um, the truth is, I barely have any time to follow up with them. And they're doing amazing, awesome things all on their own. And Gene, Q Gene, you have a role here. So I want, OK. <clears throat> in, case you can't, in case you can't see it on the video, Gene is holding up a please clap sign, um, a famous please clap sign. So. Here are some of the people that I can remember from the working group. There's probably somebody I forgot, and I'm going to feel really bad about it later. So to you, person, I apologize in advance. Um, but this is pretty exciting. We're, we're making progress. You're welcome to join in and check out on the website. Uh, these slides are online, by the way. And you can see where we have meetings and so on. What we're doing is trying to extend the rules to cover the full borrow checker. Right now, we handle that core borrow checker error. But there's other kinds of errors to report, and we want to handle those. Um, and we're trying to make these rules not only more expressive, but really clean. So right now, this, um, 
the full specification, it's written in a language called data log. I'm not going to go into that, except to say that the full Polonius rules is like 22 lines of code instead of like 6,000 lines of code, uh, which is pretty cool because they're written in this compact format. Of course, there's a bunch of support code behind that that you can just don't look behind the curtain, um, but it's nice. So that's all. Thanks a lot, everybody. Um, let's have lunch. <laughs>